Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me and inviting me to this. I'm going to talk to you today, it might be a little bit loud, I'm going to talk to you today about what, I, what my perspectives are on computing research and what that role of computing research is for the digital society that we live in today. So first off, in computing research, you ha there's a, a broad and diverse um, uh, variety of things that you can study. From the f on the one far end of the spectrum, we can study the theoretical foundations and the mathematical underpinnings of computing and information. Research in this researchers in computer theory study things like what's, what it, what it, what's possible with to do with computers? What's the computer um, capable of? What are its limitations? What, that, what might that computer be able to do in the future? At the other end of the spectrum, there's computer engineering. And this is where researchers study the design and the implementation of computing-related devices and systems. They study those trade-offs that they make with their design and their implementations. I fall somewhere in the middle. I'm interested in new technologies and new techniques that make efficient use of computers, but I apply them to systems that exist, that have real users. I, I do this because um, I have this sort of um, uh, problem-solving desire that makes me want to have immediate and direct impact on the world around me, on the people that use the computing systems that I develop. And so, and the reason why I do this is because I fundamentally believe that the, the purpose of computers is to enhance cogni uh, human cognition. That is, uh, computer, the purpose of computers is to amplify, to, um, to affect, to I improve upon the way we think about the world, how we learn within that world, and how we um, perceive the world around us. So if you think about that, if the purpose of computers is to enhance human cognition, and all humans have brains, more or less, <laughs> then all humans then should be able to use computers to acquire new knowledge and understanding, and they should be able to then, if they have that understanding, create new knowledge. They, could, they should be able to, to innovate using computers. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying all humans should be able to innovate using, using computers. So why don't we take a step back and think about whether that's really possible, what that means, whether that's something that is actually achievable. I'd start by saying it is, primarily because the underlying device, the computer itself, is inherently accessible. Right? In our digital society, they're ubiquitous. They're all over the place. They're in every corner of our lives. They're cheap. They're safe, as long as we're not driving without a hands-free device while we're using them. We don't need a nuclear power plant to power them. Right? We don't harm animals when we use them and or create them. And we have lots of software available to us. Software is the language that the computers speak. The code is the language that the computers speak. And we want the computer to do anything for us. We have to communicate with it, with this code, with these programs, with this software. And software has evolved so much over the last few years that it, it itself is contributing to the accessibility of these devices. That is, it, it, and the combination of the accessibility of the computing devices themselves and the software make these devices so easy to use and so intuitive. And I'd go so far to say that it's actually already enabling innovation by non-experts, right? I bet a lot of you in this audience tonight ha use some or one or more of these devices and have taken one or more of these devices, DVRs or uh, game consoles or navigational devices or your smartphones or your digital watch, and you've configured them. And, or you've, you've um, customized them in some way that suits you, that suits your lifestyle, suits what you enjoy using the in the way you enjoy using the device. You are innovating. Some of you have even used these devices in ways that the, the original designers didn't even imagine, couldn't even dream of. You are already innovating. And even if you're not customizing and configuring these devices, you're likely using software that you're customizing and configuring. Or you've had ideas about how you'd make that software better if you only knew how. Right? You are able to innovate. You are able to think about innovating. Computers are accessible. Not all sciences and technologies and advances are as accessible. The underlying devices are not quite as accessible. Say I want to study particle physics. I want to search for the Higgs boson. It takes me a long time just to understand what that thing is, let alone 
who's going to give me access to that device? I can't put large Hadron Collider in my garage. I can put an electric car in my garage. I'm a non-expert when it comes to electric cars, and I can drive them. I can be a user. But I can't innovate using it. I open the hood, and it freaks me out. There's way, way too much complexity. There's no way I'm going to be able to understand and advance that technology. I'm just a user, right? I can't innovate using it. We could, if I'm interested in studying um, you know, the universe and understanding how energy moves uh, you know, from black holes and exploding stars, the device you need is really expensive. And the research that you have to use is not accessible. But the research this Chandra does is accessible <laughs> and much less expensive. So let's talk about why. Why are, why are computers accessible? Well, I think it's this, that one of the reasons is it's bec really because of this thing called abstraction. And abstraction, I what abstraction is, is this way of taking something that's complex and stripping away the details, the gory details, the ugliness, to give it a, a more simpler view, right? In fact, all of computer science and engineering, I'd argue, uses abstraction at the hardware and the software layer. What's so cool is that what we do is we take these layers of abstraction in hardware or software and hide all of the ugliness that goes on down below. And what we do is then we, we open up these channels, these interfaces. We give these handles to the layers above. And so those layers can use those handles to figure out and use all that functionality that's underneath the covers without knowing what's underneath the covers, right? Abstraction is the beauty of computing devices, and this is what makes them accessible. All right, so that's really what I work on. I work on uh, software abstractions, software abstractions that hide the, the complexities of the underlying hardware systems, computer systems, so that people who are not experts, people who are not computer scientists and not computer engineers, can build on these, these interfaces and these abstractions and actually innovate to write programs that do really interesting things, do large-scale data analytics, that, that, that advance, that implement large science problems or, or mathematical problems, or that just run very cool websites, right? If it's easy for you, then you get to create, right? And then the computer scientists can work on the, the layers of software and hardware below that, in, that are what's facilitating you. But I don't look, use this, these layers of abstraction just for a single device, because that's done, that, that exists today. You have that there on your iPhone, right? What I do is I make warehouses of computers accessible to you, right? With warehouses of computers, you could, you could write really large-scale data processing tools. You could, you could write websites where millions of people could come to your website all at one time, simultaneously, and yet, you don't have to care about that. You don't have to worry about that. You just write your website. The layers of abstraction that m the research that we do hides, makes it transparent as to what's happening under the covers. You may not own a million computers, but you can bring them to bear on the problem you want to solve. And you can do it and not even know you're using them. And you can do it and not even have access to those computers. You don't have to own millions of computers, right? Let's have Google own a bunch of computers. Microsoft owns a bunch of computers. Amazon, millions of computers. UCSB, lots of computers. Not millions, lots. <laughs> right? You don't need to know that which ones you're using, when. You just need to know that you need to be able to access that compute power when you need it. Right? It should be easy for you to get to that. And that's what we work on. All right, so the second part of my title was this digital society thing. So why would this be research be important for the digital society? Right? Well, let's think about what, in our what is important today about our digital society. Well, I'm not sure about you, but every time I go to the internet, or I check my email, or I uh, l listen to my television, they're talking about this thing called big data. Many people have heard of big data. Big data is everywhere. This means that we are businesses are producing data, you are producing data, you have all your music out there, you have all of your, um, your, um, 
you know, images and videos, all of that's out there. There's tons of data. There's internet data, there's social networking data. It's all out there. Data is everywhere. And if you read the hype, I'm gonna read the hype, and I go to the internet, which is, as you know, truth. And the hype says that this is all about big data now. And I'm, of course, I'm kidding. Um, that says that the big data is the answer. These are all quotes from the internet. Uh, big data is the answer. Big data will solve all of our problems. Big data, it has transformative power. Big data, it can improve the quality of life. Big data, the new frontier for innovation, competition, and productivity. Big data, it'll make you taller and thinner and better looking. Okay, I threw in that last piece. <laughs> yeah, that's, but you get my point, right? Okay, so, um, so we have this data, all this data, all this potential. We can answer all kinds of questions with this data. We can improve our lives, we really can. There's a ton of potential here. There's a, a ton of data here. But let's take a step back for a second and ask what data is. If you put all that data in a, in a bunch of computers, it looks like this. Data is just a bunch of ones and zeros, binary numbers, right? I can't tell, maybe you can, if this is my health records, a picture of my dog, or Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinner. <laughs> it's all the same. The computer looks at it all the same, right? When data is just sitting there on the computer like that, it's not useful. So we have all that data, and this is all we got, right? So it's not the be-all, end-all. The only reason data is interesting is when we can ask questions about it, when we can give it structure, when we can ask what it's trying to show us, what it's hiding, what patterns are in there, what trends are possible, so we can make inferences and observations and predictions of the future, right? Without the ability to ask questions about the data, the data is just noise, right? Data is taking up resources in our computers, sitting there draining energy, not useful. All right, so if data is the answer, but really actually, it's only as useful as the questions we ask about it, then let's talk about how we ask questions. Well, the only way we can ask questions of a computer is through code, is through software, right? We ask questions through, by writing code that the computer then can answer for us, right? So it's only code and data together that then f allow us to forward science, to understand really hard problems like global warming, human relationships and behavior, new technologies, how social networking works, how to solve big problems like getting water to people who are thirsty and food to people who are hungry. Really, really important problems. Preventing disasters from happening or warning people at least, right? Code and data together has a potential for helping us understand our lives and improve our lives and create new things that we had never any inkling could possibly exist. Only code and data together can do it, right? So if code and data, code being the way we ask questions of the data, is what makes innovation, then let's ask who can ask the questions. If it's all about asking questions, who can ask the questions? Well, the bad news is that the people who can ask the questions right now are the super experts because the questions that have to be asked have to be written in code. And not a big, large, huge population can write code. And, and a, an even smaller portion of that population can bring to bear warehouses of computers. Right? So if that's all that we have to innovate, we're in trouble. 1% of the population, much less than 1% of the population, is able to innovate with computers, if this is the only way to innovate with computers. So my premise, my argument is what computing research should be doing in a digital society is identifying the ways of enabling and facilitating the innovation using computers by the masses. Not just by that few elite 1%, but instead by the 99%, by everyone else, right? So that's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about making software innovation easier. Not for me, not for my students, not for my colleagues, although I do love them. <laughs> but I'm interested in making uh, innovations that allow her to innovate. Because it's only when she starts to innovate, and we all are innovating using computers, that we have the potential for changing the world. 
I'm Chandra Krintz. That's my project. Thank you for listening.